uh, thank you everyone. So let me start the the the, work, the second session of this workshop. Uh, sorry about the typo, it's actually a workshop. So this second session, we will talk about a step-by-step -step guide on doing a Western blot. So in particular, chemiluminescence Western, okay? Right, so this is our agenda for today's session. Firstly, we will go through, a uh, walk through the protocol of a chemiluminescence Western blotting. Then a very general troubleshooting tips on chemiluminescence Western. Then we will look into a quick protocol, uh, a quick, uh, a short one on the fluorescence Western blot. Okay, so you would roughly know how it works in fluorescent Western. And finally, how, if you have been doing chemiluminescence Western a lot of time, how could you improve your Western blot quantitation power with total protein normalization? So this is very useful if you are wanting, you, you're trying to answer quantitative question, which means you want to relatively compare two or more groups kind of uh, expression, relative expression between one and another. You need the accurate comparison, okay? All right, so for those who just joined for today's session, okay, uh, let me introduce Azul Biosystems to you. So we are Azul Biosystems. We're from uh, in the United States-based uh, company in California and very near to Silicon Valley. So we're actually a team of highly experienced scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs. So we wanted to give you raw data that you can rely on using Sigma workflows with high performance and affordabilities. So you can have the confidence that your data is the true data and then you can, you don't need to worry about uh, anything that instruments uh, might have any um, problem they give you. Okay, so you can move on with your experiment, research and scientific and, uh, endeavor. Okay, right. So Azubai System is founded um, based on innovation. So it's a, it's a couple between Alno Shifji, our CEO. He is a venture investor and also an entre, uh, uh, entrepreneur. And also our Dr. Deeping Chair. So he is uh, our executive vice president of R&D. You can see throughout his CV, he has been uh, working with Illumina and also Alpha Innotech, which is a brand that we are so familiar with. Okay, then uh, he's also developing, he's developed uh, the first frozen Western blot CCD imager back in Alpha Innotech. If you look at our timeline, uh, we Azuba system started back in 2013. Right, so uh, the core members from Azul Biosystem are all coming from Alpha Innotech. Okay, this is a very familiar brand. Right now, it became the Protein Simple. Okay, so uh, after we founded Azul Biosystem in 2014, we, we released the first CCD camera uh, or imager that can use both LED and laser based excitation light source. And then so in back in 2014, you can do chemi and fluorescence on the imager itself. And then 2014, uh, 17, sorry, we have launched the industry first hybrid CCD imager and laser scanning system. So that means it's a CCD camera and also laser scanning inside this machine all in one. So you can detect phosphor imaging, RGB near infrared fluorescence, and also chemi luminescence. So this is our higher spec. For those who want to go for the higher end of you know, research need, this is the instrument that you should go for. All right, and then last, oh no, sorry, 2019, we have upgraded system for Azul Imaging System called Azul Imaging System from the old C series. We have a better camera, better software, and then also faster cooling and so on and so forth, okay? So this is kind of like our optimized model for a CCD-based imager right now. And last year, we have our Azul Cielo Real-Time PCR system for genomic needs. Okay, now let us recap what we have learned about uh, the previous session this uh, Tuesday. Firstly, we go through the principles of Western blot. We talk about the choice of gel, membrane, buffer, transfer system, blocking buffer, wash buffer, and also the choice and consideration for, for you to pick your primary and secondary antibodies. Next, we look into the two big categories of antibody detection, which are chemiluminescence and fluorescence methods. We have discussed about the advantages and drawbacks, time, cost, and quantitation power, each of them, and also which is right for your experiment. Okay, so after you 
detect the antibody with either these two or the methods, next is go, we going to imaging, imaging step. In here, we talk about the limitation of X-ray film. It has much smaller dynamic range than the CCD camera that we have today. So CCD camera and the rest, we call it digital imaging. And that the digital imaging can give you much more advantages, such as it shows you what is the saturation, whether the image is good for quantitation or not. And then if you're doing frozen western, so we have also talked about the considerations or option when you want to choose um, your imager for frozen western, such as excitation light source, membrane, and also the choice between the dyes like RGB and near infrared. And finally, we talk about Western blot normalization. The two big, I'll say normal way to normalize your Western blot will be housekeeping protein normalization and also total protein normalization. We'll talk about the advantages and limitations. We touch a little bit about it, but um, this will be talked more in detail in the next session, session three, next Tuesday. We're talking solely about Western blot normalization, okay? Right, so let us go through the workflow again. So this is a simplified flow chart of Western blotting workflow. It start up with electrophoresis to separate the proteins according to their molecular weight, transfer the protein within uh, the gel onto a membrane so you can do the subsequent blocking blocking step to eliminate unnecessary uh, or unspecific bindings, backgrounds, then primary antibody incubation, secondary antibody incubation, or um, ECL substrate if you're doing chemiluminescence, and finally the imaging and analysis. Okay, so this is a very simplified workflow. Hopefully this will, um, will give you an idea about how it works. Okay, we have also talked about between these two methods, which is right for you. Okay, so since we're talking about these two methods today, we're going about, we'll go walk through the protocol. You have to understand that the reason why you choose chemiluminescence, okay, for your scientific needs is this is especially good when you're trying to detect a single protein on a blot. This is very good. It has higher sensitivity, okay, it is best to uh, check the presence of absence or the protein or just simply measure the antibody response, a step after the protein verification, and also detecting low abundance of protein. Because chemiluminescence has higher sensitivity. I'll say higher detection limit than fluorescence. It can up to femtogram range. For fluorescence, this is very useful if you're trying to detect multiple proteins at the same time on the same blot. Okay, so it will save a lot of time and cost as well. And this is also good because for those to do trans post translational modification study, such as I want to study the total protein and the phosphorylated proteins of it, because these two proteins cannot be separated by gel electrophoresis based on their molecular weight. Both of these have a similar molecular weight. So the only way to do this, or the best way to do this, is you do fluorescence western, detect both on the same blot at the same time, just image it at a different channel. That's it. You don't need to do restrip and repro process. Frozens is also very good if you're trying to quantitate the loading control and also having a better in-lane normalization. So this is very good if you couple with a total protein stain. Okay. And this is so far the best method if you want to do quantitative restants. Okay. I hope uh, you understand the concept of it. And then the reason of the, the advantages, or I'll say the best choice for this is boils down to their nature of the image, or I'll say the signal itself. Chemiluminescence is a kinetic and zymatic nature. Fluorescence, it, it has a se spectral separation and is only affected by the power of the, uh, the light, excitation light, and also the amount of the antibody. So it's much more reliable than chemiluminescence, but chemiluminescence is better sensitive higher sensitivity than fluorescence. Okay, so I hope you get it clear. Let's, let us move to a detailed walkthrough of a chemiluminescence Western blot protocol. I'll be using a ECL substrate uh, called Azure Radiance. This is one of our ECL substrate range. Okay, right. Firstly, let me talk to you about chemiluminescence. 
So since 1988, okay, enhanced chemiluminescence of, or we call it ECL, has become one of the most common detection method in Western blotting. In this method, the secondary antibody is conjugated to the enzyme. Here it will be whole, uh, horse radish peroxidase or it can, it can be alkaline phosphatase as well. So in this secondary antibody, once it bound to the membrane, uh, connecting to the recognizing the primary antibody that recognizes the epitope of the protein of interest. Okay, you incubate the membrane, the whole thing, with a substrate. We call it ECL substrate. The substrate itself, okay, containing hydroxyl peroxidase, okay, and also luminol. This is called this is what we say chemical reaction. That's why it's chemiluminescence. Chemiluminescence of this luminol will emit light as a side, I would say, side uh, product. Thus, you get the you get the light is a light out of this chemical reaction. And how do you detect the light from here? It is either using X-ray film, or either using a CCD camera by means of digital imaging. Okay, so this is HRP detection. Now. Let us look at the list of material you need to use in chemiluminescence western blotting. Firstly, of course, you need to have your primary antibody to target your protein of interest. Then the secondary antibody, either it conjugate to horse, radish peroxidase or anything that is complementary or corresponding to your primary antibody. For example, if you have a primary antibody of anti-mouse, let's say anti-mouse gap DH, for example, then your secondary antibody, it should be either goat, donkey or anything, anti-mouse HRP secondary antibody. So you see how it works there, right? The, co the, the, co the combination of primary and secondary antibody, right? Of course, next you need electrophoresis, uh, apparatus, power supply, gels and buffers for your standard lamely SDS page running. So this is for the electrophoresis step, the first step of your Western blotting to separate the proteins in the sample. Okay, next is the transfer step. In this step, you will need an electro blotting apparatus and transfer buffer. Depending what kind of setup you want to do, you want to do a wet dry, a wet transfer or a semi-dry transfer, the apparatus will be different, okay? Next is will be the uh, trans indeed the transfer step as well. You need to use membrane because you need to transfer the protein from the gel to a membrane. The membrane we have two general choices here. Firstly, nitrocellulose membrane and PVDF membrane. We have talked about the advantages and the cost effectiveness of each of them in the previous session, but you can also refer this in the Western Blotting Handbook or Guidebook that you can download in the handout here. Okay, so preferably we will cut it according to the size of gel because you do not want to oversize the, the gel. So it will create a very uh, abnormal current the, it throughout the sandwich, then it will might cause some distortion in your transfer. Okay, and finally, then next we go to blocking step to mask our non-specific protein binding sites on the membrane. Thus we have blocking buffer. Washing buffer, you have the option to do either use PBS or TBST. Okay, T here stands for twin 20, all right? Metano, if you're using PVDM membrane. And we also recommend you use forcep with a flat smooth tips to transfer the plot from tray to tray or any other places. So we also recommend you do plastic forceps. Okay, because a metal forceps will sometimes will no, sometimes it will normally will leave some metal traces, which is quite bad. It will leave some dented or something will cause um, artifacts on your blood later or in an image later. Okay, incubation or washing tray trays with smooth interiors. Okay, just to make sure that the blocks are not dented. Rockery or rocking platform to you know having a, a rocking 
how to say, uh, movement, so you can wash it or incubate it properly. And finally, depending on your detection system, you want to do go digital, it will be CCD-based detection system. If you want to go for film, then it will be X-ray film. All right. Okay. So let us go to the next step. Right, so here will be the detailed protocol of each of these steps. I have uh, put up a very, I'll say, figure uh, at the bottom here, so it will be easier for your visualization. So first, protein separation and transfer. This step will be, uh, I'll be using a zoo, uh, it's a very specific protocol. It doesn't mean that this is a standard protocol. Uh, all of this, uh, one thing you have to bear in mind is, Western blood, regardless you do chemiluminescent or Western, everyone have different, uh, I'll say, tweaks about it because it's depending on the apparatus available in your laboratory, what kind of sample that you're running, and what kind of um, even weather that they kind of you're, you're locating. So that ambient temperature, th those will affect your Western blood. So though there's no one size fit all in this case. You, ne you need to optimize your own Western blotting. Flow, okay, right. So let us go to the first step: protein separation and transfer. Separate protein transfer, a protein sample by polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis here using a mini size gel. Normally, it will be eight times ten centimeter. And during the uh, electrophoresis time, you can pre-wet the PVDF membrane in a hundred percent methanol for one minute until the membrane is completely wet. Then you transfer the wet membrane from the mid tunnel to a purified water. You can either use mini quality or distilled water and incubate the membrane on the rocker for at least five minutes. This is to make sure that the membrane is fully immersed in water and does not float on the water surface. Because when it floats on the water surface, you do not the water is not really rinsing the uh, upper surface of the membrane itself, okay? Right, next, tr transfer the membrane from water to transfer buffer. So this is a prepping step uh, during the gel electrophoresis, then you move into transfer step, all right? And EQ, the membrane will now incubate for five to 10 minutes. So you see that you active, this is in the PVDF membrane, yeah? Nitrocellulose, you're not supposed to use it, a meta or any alcohol to activate it, okay? It will melt in alcohol, so don't do that, okay? Only PVDM membrane will need methanol to activate it, all right? Okay, so, okay, so the step is here for the PVDM membrane, membrane activation, water incubation, then transfer buffer. Okay, so now, your electrophoresis should be done. It should be completed. Okay, then you should assemble, we call it transfer sandwich. Um, after you assemble the transfer sandwich, then you can put inside, here we're using wet transfer, all right? Put inside the wet transfer tank and um, overnight at 15 volt, or you can do one or two hours at 70 volt. Okay, in the ice pack. So because it is high, higher voltage, you need ice to cool it down or else the gel will melt, all right? The same thing applies to your gel electrophoresis. If you can, put it in the cool room or normal practice, what I will do is I'll put it on top of ice. So I'll keep the tank cool so the gel will not be melt during the electrophoresis step. Right, so after protein separation and transfer, now you have a membrane with the protein on top of it, right? Okay, then you should move to membrane blocking and bindings of the primary antibodies. Okay, so we now have the membrane with the proteins on top of it, okay? Put it into a tray filled with purified water so you can wash off all the transfer buffer previously, okay, for five minutes. Then you can go on with your blocking step. Blocking buffer here, what we choose is non-fat dry milk blocking buffer, okay? This set will be carried out for one hour at room temperature with gentle agitation. We have a formula here for, so you can calculate based on how much volume you needed for, to prepare the blocking buffer for adequate blocking, all right? So 
In the meanwhile, you can prepare your primary antibody solution or mix in the blocking buffer together. Okay, so the here, the reason why we, we prepare the primary antibody mix with a blocking buffer because you during the incubation of your primary antibody, you can also block at the same time. So we we'll increase the, uh, I'll say, binding specificity, okay, uh, in this case. So you, you will reduce the, the chances of, to, of you seeing unspecific binding in the later stage, all right? So when you prepare or dilute the primary antibody in a blocking buffer, you gently mix the incubation solution by inverting the tube several times. Do not vortex the tube, okay? Because antibodies are delicate. Any, you, you, do you know the kinetics, of, you mean the solution kinetics is also a kind of energy. So if you kind of like the energy will transfer to the antibody, then it might, it might cause, I don't know, disruption or, uh, anything during the incubation stage, it might give you a higher back, uh, signal to back, uh, sorry, noises in the background, right? So optimal primary antibody dilution must be determined and pre okay? Uh, in a general practice, you can either follow manufacturer recommendation, then you work your way up, either increasing or decreasing the concentration based on your, uh, based on the trials, okay? Right, so we have the blocking step and we have the primary uh, primary antibody um, step, okay? We, you can incubate the primary antibody uh, for one hour at room temperature. This is a fast method with gentle agitation. You can also have the option to do it at four degree overnight. The best um, time I would say is between 12 to 16 hours because that is the, uh, they have studied about the kinetics between the antibody and the protein epitopes. So because you, you know that once they're binding hard, uh, you will start to dissociate as well. So the time frame is between 12 to 16 hours. If you're doing overnight incubation at four degrees Celsius for primary antibody incubation, okay? Right, next, after you do your primary antibody incubation, you need to wash off these excessive primary antibody, okay? Transfer the membrane, into a tray filled with wash buffer, either PBST or TBST, and do use a clean plastic forceps to transfer it. You do not want to see any artifacts or residuals of any other things previously on the blot because it will render your image or your blot completely useless for quantitation later or analysis later. Okay, so here what we do is we do a quick wash, just a rinse, quick rinse with the washing buffer. One time wash, 15 minutes. Okay, we have the formula here. So you see, this is a minimal uh, volume that required for the membrane. So you can increase the volume, okay, so for better washing as well, right? Okay, one time wash with 15 minutes, then three times wash with five minutes each, okay? So all these steps are with gentle excitation, okay? Okay, so here is the example of how you calculate the washing, the wash buffer required for each of the washing step. So let's say for a standard seven times nine membrane, you need almost 50 mil of wash buffer for the 15 minute wash, and also around 20, uh, 20 mil of wash buffer for five minute wash. But you have to be careful as well. Besides the volume of the wash buffer, the tray size also matters. If you have a, you know, very broad, a big tray size, then of course you need a higher volume because or else it wouldn't cover the broad, right? Yeah. So in this case, the tray we say here, they are, they are nicely fit to the membrane. So they might have 10 times 10 centimeter of, um, you know, area. So for you to do all this uh, washing and incubation. Okay. All right. So the reason why we say, uh, one thing to mention, one, the reason why you say you use clean plastic for sap, uh, not the metal one, because um, the scratches or damage on the block surface of the membrane will create active sites that can cause or absorb secondary antibody conjugates and giving you artifacts or higher background. Okay, so this one we, we recommend you to use plastic for sap. Okay, 
right after you wash off the excessive uh, excess primary antibody next you need to incubate this in the secondary antibody right same thing you can dilute the secondary antibody mix in the blocking buffer gently mix the incubation solution by inverting the tube several times and do not vortex the tube okay same thing the optical optimal secondary antibody dilution must be determined empirically. Recommended um, dilution will be one in five thousand or one in twenty thousand, right? A good initial solution to start with is one in ten thousand. Okay, so you don't. Uh, the reason is you don't. You 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 will avoid uh, having a high background by the end of the imaging step. Okay, if you're doing film detection. You need to use two to five times less a secondary antibody than you do for CCD imaging. For example, for CCD imaging, we use one in ten thousand dilution. If you're doing extra film detection by the end of, in chemiluminescence, one in fifty thousand dilution is a good starting point. Okay, right. Incubate this, the membrane in the secondary antibody solution for one hour at room temperature with gentle agitation. Throughout the whole process, your membrane shouldn't be dry. It must be wet at all times or else the, the, you will realize the blood is not longer able to, you know, wet in this kind of buffer. You need to activate it again with methanol, all right? Okay, after secondary antibody incubation, you need to wash off the excess of, uh, of the secondary antibodies. Same thing we do, you use either PBS or TBS, PBST or TBST, use a clean faucet to transfer the membrane, do a one-time quick wash and three times a five-minute wash, okay, depending on the solution. The reason is we use three times and five-minute wash because the dilution that we use is very low it's one in ten thousand i know a lot of, uh, uh, some of the labs they might be using one in five thousand or one in twenty five thousand the dilution is a bit too high so if you're using higher dilution like one in five thousand for example your washing step must be either longer or more frequent you either increase the frequency and increase the time to wash off excessive secondary antibody because or else you will see very high background when you do the imaging set. Okay? Right. Finally, you need to enhance the chemiluminescence signal. Here, uh, the example I used will be a zoo radiant substrate. We have the minimal um, require, volume required to cover the blot over here. So you can see there are two ways of you to put the easier substrate on the membrane. One, you do it generously, okay? You prepare the substrate at the maximum volume. Sometimes you'll put one to one and uh, I think one mil or 0 0.5 mil per centimeter square of the area. Then you do it in the tray, okay? A gentle excitation incubation for two minutes, okay? Or you can do it in a minimal, on a minimal working amount. How you do that is you put the blot, as you can see here, there's a tray, you put a blot and you put the mix on top on the membrane. Okay, you need to have a sufficient amount so it covered the whole membrane and all this solution will be held by surface tension. All right, so, it, so to make sure that both of these way, Okay, I will recommend you go for the right hand side one means prepare it generously because you don't want to risk having some part of your blood not having the ECL substrate incubated. All right, then it will mess up your whole uh, Western blotting uh, result. Okay, right. Finally, imaging your Western blot. You need to drain off all these excess substrate reagent either via capillary action by touching a keen wipe or other absorbents like filter paper or some sort to the edge of the blot. So what you can do, for example, you have a blot here, you can either use a keen white touch here, okay, to remove the excess substrate, ECL substrate. While the blot is damp, like I say, it must be wet at all time, okay, cover it with a transparent plastic wrap. 
You can either do it with plastic wrap. You can do it either on cling, a cling wrap. Uh, Azul, we have a, a block developing a plastic folder, which is like a folder, but it's transparent. All right. So you can insert your blood inside, then uh, smoothen it out, make sure the blood is wet, then go for imaging. This will allow your blood, okay, remain wet while you expose it for a longer period of time. Because if let's say during your exposure, this part of the uh, top right of part of your, okay, on the right hand side, let's say, right hand side of your blood is getting dry. You won't see the ECL signal at all. Okay, so you must make sure your blood is damp at all times, especially during the imaging step. Okay, so here goes the detailed protocol of your uh, chemiluminescence western. Next, let us look at the troubleshooting uh, on the chemiluminescence western. Yeah, all right, so a little touch about this slide is on the left, you can see this is a uh, chemiluminescence western, for, uh, okay, on the digital imager. That's why you can see how it has the much color marker so it's easier for you to identify the molecular weight of your protein of interest and also the housekeeping here so you know that all oh, the protein that are detected is really the protein you wanted to look for all right on the right it will be x-ray film this is how it looks like as you can see it will just be uh like you can see on the um, digital image but without the color markers all right okay all right troubleshooting when you see something like this Okay, if you're doing um, strip and report process, okay, let's say I'm doing my protein of interest, then I strip, I strip off the secondary antibody, I incubate with the other primary antibody for my uh, housekeeping, for example, then carry on with the rest of the, the protocol. Then when you image it, I realize, hey, what I see a very weird um, image, for example, uh, a very vague bands. This is this means your membrane is not fully stripped. So you need to make sure you have enough stripping buffer, okay, the volume itself and the time. So you can properly strip off all the secondary antibody, then incubate fresh, a good uh, primary antibody for your protein of interest, second protein of interest, okay? But uh, like I said in the previous um, uh, session, strip and report process has the risk. I'll say it has high risk of losing your protein amount because sometimes uh, the choice of the stripping buffer, time, temperature, and even agitation matters, okay? So we don't really recommend uh, you to do strip and report on chemi essence. Either um, if you really need to, let's say here, because both of these proteins are at a similar molecular way, I will recommend you to go for fluorescent straight away. You will save your time and you don't worry that your protein might be losing if uh, the, the expression were not longer valid in this case. Okay, right here, if you see something image like this, some image like this, this is what it means is still we are within the stripping and report process. So this means that you didn't wash it properly, okay, before the stripping or after the stripping. Right, so stripping here, I didn't, I didn't mention in the previous protocol because uh, that protocol is specifically for one protein as, uh, detection. We're not doing double protein uh, detection there, okay? In the strip and report process, what we will normally do is you, after you image your blood, okay, with your protein interest A, for example, you wash off the ACL substrate with a purified water. Here we say it, rinse the blood with purified water for at least five minutes before stripping. So after you rinse off all the ECL and whatever on the blood, okay, after you image it of your protein interest A, then you can do your strip and report process. Because the blood right now is clean, it's clean of the ECL substrate, then you can go on strip, stripping the secondary antibodies off the blood right now. And after you strip the secondary antibodies off the blood, do not wash it with wash buffer, okay? You need to wash it with either just purified water or PBS, okay? Not PBS tea, okay? PBS, okay? Or the easiest one, just go with water. Just remove whatever uh, stripping buffer that you put on it. Normally, it will be either alkaline, like uh, uh, sodium hydroxide, uh, that kind of uh, 
uh, stripping buffer. Right, so if you do it properly, now you'll see that, oh, you have a clean plot after the strip and probe, reprobe process. All right, here, you can see here, uh, this is, I'll say this is a total protein stain because you see there's multiple proteins here, okay, protein bands, but you see there's some odd bubbles within the, the blot itself, on the blot itself. So what does this mean? This means the bubble exists in, during the transfer step. Okay, your transfer sandwich must be tight, okay, must be wet at all time, right? So how you can do with, you press and smooth your filter paper after covering the membrane to remove all the bubbles. Don't, but you, you gently press it, don't just heavily press the filter paper. You don't want to squish or squash the gel, all right? Do it gently. Okay, and also make sure you have enough transfer buffer in the cartridge. Either you do wet transfer or semi-dry transfer. You need to make sure the transfer sandwich is wet. Okay, right. So this is how you do it for if you see something like this. Next is a, a, this is a swirl protein on the blood itself. So what, what this is, it means is you have insufficient or uneven transfer pressure. Like I said, your transfer sandwich should be tight. It, sh it shouldn't be too tight, but it should be nicely tight, okay? Um, and place a gel and a membrane in the middle, okay? So one way to, to, uh, to help with this is you might have abnormal current or electrical current at the side of your semi-dry or wet transfer setup. So put it them in the middle. So you just ensure that they have enough circulation and electrical current to go through the transfer process. So after you do this, you have a nicely transferred uh, proteins on the plot itself. Then you'll see them um, having a cleaned background like this. Okay, here, this will be a antibody problem if you see something like this, because you're supposed to see a single specific band detected on your chemi Westerns. If you see multiple bands or even smearing, right, it might indicate a poor quality of antibodies. What you need to do is once you receive your antibody, okay, if it's thought, have been stored properly, okay, it does not having shipping damage, you know, store it properly, keep it nicely, screen your antibody either doing dot blot, okay, testing it out with your positive control, just to see that, oh, you get a nice band, all right? Some of the companies, uh, they will allow you to replace the antibody uh, within a, a valid uh, time timeline for time frame, for example, once you've proven that your the, the antibody is giving you unspecific bindings, unlike uh, what they claim on the website. Okay, so for this, there are a lot of reasons. One thing is poor quality antibody. Okay, um, the this will cause non-specific bindings. Like you see here, the multiple protein bands, and also don't put too much primary antibody. This will be also a problem or you're not blocking enough. That means your concentration of your blocking buffer is not sufficient to block off all these uh, unspecific uh, noise or signals, okay? So there are multiple reasons for it. So you can tackle one by one by tweak, uh, by adjusting one parameters at one time. Don't do it, don't be greedy, adjusting a lot of things at one time because you don't know what is the cause or what is contributing to this, um, I'll say, error, okay? After you do it nicely, you should see a very nice, clean, one specific bands on your chemi Western. Okay, finally, this is a, a high background. High background, which is something we usually see, how you can, what you can do is firstly, reduce your primary antibody concentration by increasing the dilution factor. Okay, you need to do some optimization of it. This is the optimization uh, process. Also, you can try a different blocking buffer. The blocking buffer may not be sufficient to block off all these background. Um, if you have been trying, let's say, the uh, skim milk, this means uh, non-fat dry milk, you can try BSA. I said previously, BSA might be a good option as well. And also you can try to have a shorter exposure time when you image the blood as well. And finally, this is related to your secondary antibody. Increase your washing time or frequency, right? To remove the background, right? So these are a the few methods to tackle high background. Right, so no or low signal. So if you see nothing on your plot, right, you need to check whether you're using a, the correct and primary antibody. 
and secondary antibody that recognize your primary antibody. For example, if your primary is an anti is a rapid antibody, that means it's derived from a rabbit, your secondary should be something anti the rabbit. Okay, so the pairings is how, how it works here. Right, okay, speckled background. This is what we call as artifacts. This might be a rise from uh, many reasons. Normally, the buffer to use throughout the Camelomism Western. What we recommend you do is firstly, filter your secondary antibody. It might have some clumps or coagulants, something that you are not wanting inside the solution at all. Okay, then you can also filter your blocking or washing buffer. Okay, so you can remove those uh, these kind of debris. And if you've done all this, you still see speckle background, make sure that your lab environment is clean. Okay, so you can minimize the dust, debris, or other particles that may come in contact with the blot. One way to do this is cover your tray during incubation or washing step. Don't leave them exposed in the uh, open air because anything in the air can go on the blot itself. Okay, and we also recommend you to use non powdered glove, or if you have been using non powdered glove, should switch to the different kind of glove. Okay, so because this speckled background might come from the dust from your glove itself. So we recommend you to use powder, pow, pow, sorry, this powder, this type of here, powder free nitrile glove or polyethylene glove. Okay, right, so this is pretty much for chemiluminescence detail walkthrough, protocol walkthrough, and troubleshooting. Next, let us go to a quick, get, get a quick look at the fluorescence Western protocol. Yeah, so I'll be explaining the protocol using Azul Spectra reagent. This is a concept of a fluorescent western. Here we see that it is best to quantitate two proteins at the same time. That's why it is called quantitative two color assays. How it works with it's the same thing. You have the same primary antibody recognizing uh, protein A and protein B. Then you have a secondary antibodies. Uh, with uh, with different dye of fluorophores, these fluorophores are different. They have different spectra, they have different excitation and emission wavelength. So you can image both of them on the blot. Okay, at the same time, just switch the channel. That's it. Right. Okay. So let us look at the list of material. Same thing. You will still everything is the same like your chemiluminescent western. You need primary antibody. Okay, secondary antibody. Let's say. And uh, electrophoresis apparatus, electroblotting apparatus. Here, like I say, in fluorescence western, you need to use PVDM membrane. If you can opt for low fluorescence PVDM membrane, that would be the best. Because nitrocellulose, it has so such, such a high background that you cannot negate in the later stage of the analysis. Okay. Then, of course, there are different types of blocking buffer and washing buffer in the fluorescence one. I will not go details about it. If you're interested, uh, we can have another session about fluorescent western um, workshop, which purely talk about fluorescent western. Right. Okay, so this is a secondary antibody, as you can see here, we call it Azul Spectra. We have Rapid 650, okay, this excitation wavelength, and Mouse 550 excitation wavelength. And because since we're using PVDM membrane, you need methanol to activate it, okay. Washing, Buffer in this case will be the same thing, PB, PBS or TBS, but without the twin in this case, right? Forset with flat smooth teeth, preferably plastic forset. Powder free glove, okay, polyethylene glove are preferred. Incubation or washing trays with smooth interiors. Same thing, rocking or rotary platform to give the gentle agitation throughout the process. And also background crunching sheet. If you're doing fluorescence, because you want to get that nice black background for your fluorescence image. Let us look at the protocol. Okay, very easy. You just prepare the blot, um, then uh, ROS electrophoresis, uh, transfer, then block the membrane for 10 minutes at room temp. Okay, so this is a very quick trans. Uh, this is a quick protocol using our Azul reagent. We have a quick, quick uh, protocol uh, reagent to use. Um, okay, so then we go for primary antibody, washing, wash, uh, wash, washing step, secondary antibody incubation with gentle agitation as well, washing step, then finally place a plot on the quenching sheet, 
drain the excessive liquid and capture the image either using CCD camera or some higher end of the uh, detector as well. Okay, so this is the image that you will get by the end of your fluorescent western. You will get a merge of all three channels if you're doing uh, two or three uh, multiplexing westerns in this case. So each of them, they are image in different channel. All right, so even though they are at a similar molecular weight, let's say, you don't worry that they are overlapping with each other because of the spectral separation of the 404 itself. It's uh, and also the instrument, okay, it kind of cut off all the uh, light leakage, okay, and excitation light source. The, those are matters as well, okay. Digital image of three color western blot using a uh, zoo, okay, 600, uh, which I'll explain later, okay, because we have a we have a, a laser and also LED excitation light source, okay. Right, pretty much about done about uh, chemiluminescence, western and frozen westerns. Next, uh, let me propose to you. If you have been doing chemiluminescence western and you want to enjoy better quantitation power, in this case will be total protein stain, we have a system that is my work for you, for you to consider, which is we call it as Azure 300Q. Okay, the Q stands for quantitation, right? So the reason being is because we, right now we have been understand that, okay, uh, quantitation is very important in uh, Western blotting, especially I think in the normal setting, we just want, we need to quantitate the relative com uh, expression between two or more groups. You want it to be accurate and reproducible over the time. So I say before, housekeeping is one band. Total protein stains is many bands. So one versus many, of course, many will stand out because it reduces the error and variability, okay? Okay, so uh, I want to go in details about why uh, total protein stain is better than housekeeping. This we will talk about in the next session in detail. If you still want to go for your housekeeping protein because of the limitation of apparatus and equipment, how you could do to improve it in terms of housekeeping protein, all right? Okay, so for quantitative resin, what we recommend is Azure 300Q. The Q stands for quantitative channel for fluorescent green channel. So you having this extra fluorescent green channel, what you can do is you can use any total stain dye, okay, to your chemi resin. So you can have image, you can image both chemi and your uh, total protein uh, image at the same time. You don't need to do strip and reprobe anymore, okay. Uh, on the right here, we have all the Azure imaging system models, all are upgradable, okay? So the reason why we propose this is because we have two total protein stains, which is Azure Red and Total Stain Q, right? So the optimal excitation for these two will be the frozen green channel. So there are other options as well in terms of total protein stains, which I will explain in the next session, the workshop next Tuesday, about how you choose the total protein stain and so on and so forth. Okay, so let, let us stay here first. Okay, how you can use with this machine is you can have the option, okay, you choose chemiluminescence and azure red. This is the dye that you use. Okay, basically it is a green fluorescent channel. Then you take it at the same time. So what you can get is something like this. You have your chemi image plus the total protein image together. So you can do total protein normalization in your chemi resin block. This is very simple. It allows you to have higher quantitation power Okay, so you don't need to worry about your loading uh, error, pipetting error, and so on and so forth, or even worry about your sample having different kind of housekeeping expression because of the experimental condition, right? So this is a way for you to enjoy this, right? Okay, so this, the model is not listed here, but basically we have all these 300Q, okay, uh, 300 for Kami, and then we are up to 600, uh, which has for mainly for uh, Western frozen, uh, frozen and also Kami uh, applications. All of these models can do, okay, trans white, true color, UV, we have two UV channels here and also blue light. So you can see there's a lot of application you can do with this. I'll show you an example what a Zoo 600 can do. So this is a fossil that uh, from our client, Okay, so this is how they use this Azure 600 to visualize this. So all these are not published. So uh, please bear in mind, these are not published yet. Okay, so what it has in this Azure 600 is, we have um, 
LED for regular, uh, RGB, fluorescent signals, excitation light source, and laser for near infrared. The reason we have near infrared laser for near infrared because near infrared we have two uh, excitation. Okay, which you need a proper energy like 680 near infrared 680 and near infrared 800. This cannot be done, or I will say this will be best in laser because it is high energy beam. If you're using LED, you might have a signal crossed out between the two near infrared channel or even with the red channel in the RGB dice. Okay, so you can do the standard in this uh, system. You can do standard uh, DNA gel, UV blot, and safe dyes. Okay, Western blot, chemi Western image with a color marker merge, frozen Western as well. There are others like Comessi, Comessi uh, gel and silver stains and bacteria, frozen bacteria, and even up to small animals. Uh, sorry, not animals. Uh, zebra fish over here. So and um, these are fossils and others. Okay, so gel to uh, gel as well. So there's a lot of possibility with you can do with this machine because of the design of the RGB and near infrared plus all these uh, I'll say traditional or something we are very familiar of like UV and everything. So like I say UV, we have two we have two uh, channels. Okay, so you can use it with safe dyes and cyber green and also with uh, conventional ethidium bromide. Okay, so next is a fire biomolecular imager. This is a higher highest end of uh, instrument that we have. Okay, so like I said, we don't have L, uh, LED excitation here. Everything will be laser. So it will give you very good signal, very good background. Uh, no, sorry, very low background. And we have specific detectors for all these signals as well. Like CCD will be for your chemi. Right now, CCD is the best uh, imaging. Uh, I'll say detector for chemi signals. So we have PMT and APD for uh, RGB and near infrared uh, signals and also phosphor imaging. So we couple these three together, detectors together in a single machine with a very good excitation light source, laser. So you can have the, the versatility and also flexibility in doing all kinds of application. Right, so these are publication from our system, Sapphire Biomolecular Imager, Chemiluminescent Western, Fluorescent Western, Phosphor Imaging on MSA, and Protein Arrays. Uh, bear in mind, this is a chemi, chemi signal, so you, you can do it in with, with our system because it's a scanner, right? So this is on the slide. And uh, uh, has been used in developing uh, something which is very familiar with us, uh, cause SARS called uh, coronavirus 2 um, kit, okay, which is color metric. So it's been used for develop, development validation on the spe sensitivity and specific, uh, specificity of this kit that will be used on field outside rave bus using clinical samples. This is from Korea, okay. I can then this machine can also be used to do tissue imaging. What it uses is it uses the auto it image auto first signals from the tissue itself. So our tissue will have auto first signals. So you can use to check the morphology of the uh in this case will be a liver. Okay. Right. We can do whole mouth scan because it's a scanner, you can fit up to 2.5 cm. Do 3D reconstruction with the frozen image and IHC scan for the no, normal uh I'll say DIG and also for the signals. And we have also AO absorbance microplate reader. Okay, so here you can see that uh, it is very intuitive. It's a very big uh, touch screen. We have up to eight, you can fit up to eight filter position. So you have a range of filters uh, ranging for 340 nanometer wavelength up to 750 nanometer wavelength. So there's a lot of uh, signals you can detect with this AO absorbance reader. Okay. Um, right, so let me recap what we have talked about today. Walk through the chemi luminescence Western protocol, okay? Uh, detail uh, each of the steps, what you need to do, what times you've taken. But do bear in mind that this is applicable to that particular protocol. Your own Western blot or Western blotting need to optimize to feed your own scientific needs and samples and even ambient temperature and apparatus you have, instrument you have in your own lab. Okay, so this is not to say the standard. You need to on standard. Okay, then we look at the troubleshooting in the chemi westerns roughly about what you can see on the gel, 
or what you can roughly estimate what went wrong and what you can do about it. Okay, then we look at the we'll take a quick look at the frozen western. Uh, like I say, it's very easy. You can do multiplex, and also if you proposing you an instrument, if you want to enjoy total protein normalization in your chemi western. Okay, so this is pretty much what we talk about today. If you have any question about detailed steps, what to do, you can actually write to me. We can formulate another session, specifically talking about the tricks to run your Western. I know that there's a lot of uh, hidden tricks in your uh, Western blotting that will help tremendously for amateur or beginners or Western, uh, Western blot uh, user. Okay, right. Here we go for Q&A session. Uh, let me open up the floor and check out the question I will answer. Okay. Hang on, let me enlarge my Q&A screen. Okay. Uh, All right, let me see. Oh, mostly have been answered. Okay, let me check on it. Stripping is the same as washing. Yeah. Okay, let me answer the first, first question which has been uh, sent to me uh, uh, before this about um, let me see about a uh, chromogenic uh, detection. So as I say before, we have two major fluorescent signals. Okay, let me let me put out a slide. Sorry, uh, we have two major detection in Western blotting. Okay, here I'll actually talk about chemiluminescence and fluorescence. There's a third method in Western blotting. The third method is called chromogenic or colorimetric. Western blot detection. So here uh, from Jacinta, uh, she will be using, I, th I think she, sorry, okay, uh, will be using BCIP and NBT substrate. All right, so this combination for chromogenic Western blot, um, it is the, the most sensitive combination for chromogenic, okay, for chromogenic sense, it is the most sensitive right now. But if you, let's say, want me to compare it with chemiluminescence and fluorescent detection method, it is. It has a limitation because, like you see, this col this chromogenic detection only gives you a dark purple color. So what you can do is you either scan the blot on or take a photo of it. Okay. Then the thing is, it cannot give you the saturation signal, whether the signal is saturated or not. It has the least sensitivity compared to the rest of the two methods. Okay. Chemi and fluorescence, and you please bear in mind that different brands of substrate they may have different detection of limit. If I were you, I have to use this chromogenic detection. It is good for checking, you know, uh, a very quick one because you can see by eyes. You don't need any other instruments to actually give you the data. You just need to scan and do image J. It's it's fine. But uh, the thing is, you might need to go to quantitate or do a standard curve, okay? Try out a load, a series of protein load, okay? And then to check the signal linearity of the substrate that you use. See, then plot the graph and see what is the limitation of detection, where it falls on, where it falls off, okay? Then you check on your own sample, whether your sample is within that range or not. If let's say the protein for interest, your protein of interest, is very low, low in the expression, I would recommend you to go for chemiluminescence because it can be detecting up to femtogram signals. Okay, so this is my recommendation. Uh, but also I, I know that uh, this chromogenic is a very easy one because you don't need any uh, other instrument to, to get the data. This is a very cheap and cost effective way, but I'll say uh, depending on your application because I don't know what is your uh, I'll say samples and so on, you might need to consider about the signal itself. 
I'll say check the signal linearity, check your sample whether it can be detected nicely, when repeatedly can be detected nice, then you can go for it. Or else you might need to opt for chemi or fluorescence. That's my advice. I hope this answers your question. Let me move to uh, the question that I've submitted today's session. Okay, let me go to the first question. Okay, what is stripping? Is it the same as washing? Okay, sorry that I didn't mention it um, prop correctly. Okay, stripping here means like this. I have a protein, I have two protein for interest. They cannot be separated by press. I can put up the, okay, like here. In this, this uh, photo, for example. I have the protein of interest. I, I cannot separate them properly by electrophoresis because their molecular weight is too near. So what you can do, one thing is um, you can do strip and reprobe. What you do, you probe your protein A, okay? Detect, capture the image of protein A. Then you strip the secondary antibodies of the membrane, then wash it properly, incubate with your primary antibody of the protein B. That is called strip and reprobe process. Okay, this is working if you have, if you really need to detect two or more separate proteins on the same plot at the same similar location. But personally, I will highly recommend if you have such need, go for fluorescence because it saves you a lot of time and don't you don't worry about the loss of protein amount as well. I hope this answers your question. Uh, Yong, if you have still have doubt, please uh, email me so I can give you uh, what is it likes and uh, the, uh, give, give you some, uh, I'll say, guidance or text or paper or scientific paper for you to read up. Okay. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Zim. I always had a feeling of not getting the right amount of my protein intensity after playing around with the saturation. Okay, chemi method. How do we know that we're getting the real protein bands and not the saturated band? Right, so in the, in chemi methods, uh, it's depending what kind of system you're using. If you're using extra film, there's no way for you to know whether the bands is saturated or not. So that's the limitation of extra film. But if you're using CCD imager, it's your, uh, any CCD camera, digital imaging, it should have a saturation indication. Any saturator, let's say this band is saturated, it will mark in red color. Let's say this particular pixel is saturated, it will mark in red color. So you know that this image is saturated, this band is saturated, you cannot use this image. This is how you recognize it. I hope this answers your question. This is a normal setting in a CCD-based digital imager. Uh, you should be able to look at it, okay, in your um, digital imager, if you have it. Okay, so the way is uh, play around is reducing the exposure time. If you keep getting saturated images, reduce the exposure time, or you tweak around with your primary and secondary antibody dilution. That's also the way to go. But you have to be careful not to sacrifice your low expression protein signal as well. So there's something you need to work around to optimize your Westerns. Okay. Okay, I hope you answer the question. Next is, um, let me look at it. All right. Oh, there's one question from uh, Shadana. The advantages of the frozen Western block compared to chemiluminescent is the Western block don't need the blocking step. Oh, no, no, you, you still need blocking. You still need blocking. Yes, you need blocking in the both, like I say here, you see, if you see in this workflow, you will do the same thing, except after the primary antibody, the choice of primary antibody will be different. You still need to go through electrophoresis, transfer, and blocking because you need to block off an unspecific bindings. All right. The reason why it is faster because first thing, you don't need to um, you don't need to do restrip and repro process. If you're detecting multiple proteins on the same blood, like here. You don't, you don't need to do strip and report. You can have all the proteins image in a single Western blotting workflow. You're just changing the channel, capture image, then you're good to go. That blot is done. And you have multi, you have data on 
few uh, protein A, B, and C, or even your housekeeping with, uh, with the same block. So this is the way to reduce the time. The time reduction is this, if the, because of the multiplexing capability. Why is taking longer time in chemiluminescence? Because sometimes you might, you might be cutting your block into multiple strips. But uh, you have to be careful if you want to publish this, because some of the journals, they will request you to show a full Western block image. So a full Western block image means not cutting, not cut image. It's a full Western block image. So they expect you to have a full image, full block with one protein on top of it. So uh, depending on your application or your publication uh, requirement, Okay, so that's why I say frozen will cut down the time a lot because you, you can fulfill the publication requirement, but you, you still can provide all the, all the data that they need. You don't need to do sweep and report. Okay, I hope I answer your question. Okay, uh, let me go for the next one. Uh, so we have a question from, follow-up question from Azim. 600 system can act as a fluorescent microscope taking RGB and near infrared uh, images as well. How thick is the sample if you can recall? I, may I know how far red, far red can also, okay, far red means a dye, right? Okay, so the, the samples that we can detect right now, if it's not mistaken, is up to, we, we call it uh, the focus, is up to, let me say, maybe 5 cm. Okay, uh, anything taller than 5 cm, the camera will be uh, out of focus. Okay, and we have the option to tune the focus focus plane as well in the Azul 600 uh, or all of them, all of these. Sorry, let me go Hello. to Hello. this. Sorry for interruptions. Oh, no problem. Yeah, so regarding the focus that you mentioned just now, um, it's it's not actually 5 cm so we have uh, we have researchers that using um, the 600 system to capture plants that's planted in a pot so it can fit into the chamber of the system so from there we can do the manual focusing on focusing on the plant itself the reason is being why is because the iso 600 system is designed to have a very good depth of field so no matter what thick of your sample is maybe it's tall the plant a thick gel or or maybe a, a, a small rabbit <laughs> it won't be so small sorry maybe a rat um, we can do a customizable focus. You can do a manually focus to focus on the sample itself. So we don't really know how thick the samples that we can really um, capture. It will be depending on the try and error on the sample itself. So we don't have an exactly set it's 5 cm. Um, as long as you fit in the chamber and um, the manual focusing is able to focus on your sample. So far we have plants that sitting on a pot and it works. Thanks, I, I Nicole, for that. Thanks. You're welcome. Yep. So the reason I put the, uh, uh, I'll say 5 cm because I also estimate the, the, the deck size of it. Uh, but I, I think the, what, uh, Azim may want to know is, um, how, how tall the sample can fit and can be imaged. So I think Nicole's answer will be more accurate in this sense. Yeah. The, the second question would be, may, May uh, the far rate can be also be used. So in this case, if you look at the near infrared in 600, our signals is it can be imaged up to near infrared 800 nanometer wavelength. So this is what we can we can it can be done. So higher than 800, I don't think it's workable. It can also be excited, but it may not it may not giving you the optimal signals. That's what I can say here. So the best or calibrated or say the best image again out will be up until near infrared 800 channels. That is what I can say. Okay, so the one we have one more question from Iza. Okay, how many times stripping can be done on one blot? Okay, uh, to be honest, two times. Uh, no, sorry, one time means you strip only one time. Uh, because we, the more you strip, the more protein you're gonna lose. Uh, this is very important. 
you can find a lot of publication out there they're comparing different kind of stripping buffer protocol and they have a general come to a general conclusion that stripping will reduce the amount of total protein on your blood even though you try to you know minimize the interaction and everything you still will lose some of the proteins so what is the practice that we normally do i normally do back in the days was my protein a okay my they, i cannot separate them by the gelatophoresis you bear in mind this I cannot separate them by gelatophoresis two proteins let's say i'm doing i'm studying actin and let's say alpha actin or some actin that has a similar molecular weight okay what i will do is something like this i will do the first round i'll do my protein of interest i will image my protein of interest then i'll strip and probe for my housekeeping protein that is what i will do because we're hoping that the housekeeping protein because it's high abundant highly expressed it can withstand the loss of the protein throughout the stripping process. So this is by assumption, but it may not be true. Okay. Um, so I will recommend only one time. I'll recommend one time only. More than one time, I cannot guarantee the protein amount anymore. That is what I can say. Okay. I hope this answers your question. Uh, but if you really have to do strip and report, please do consider go for fluorescence because uh, to be honest, I do not, uh, it will be a disastrous if one day you want, let, let's say like this, in the future, you, you have your own lab or you, you want to carry out with your study and you have the chance to do it on fluorescence, then you realize, eh, why my second protein signals is higher than my previous data. You, you get what I mean? So in, it, this, this might, this might be have a very it might confuse you you might you may start to doubt your own data privacy so i will say if possible go for fluorescence if you have the apparatus instrument or if you have the budget seriously go for fluorescence okay uh hope i answer your question yeah everything has been answered thank you very much thank you nicole for answering them okay so here goes the Q&A. Oh, sorry. Let me go to the... Yeah, so we are a zoo bio system. So if you have any questions about Western blotting, please feel free to ask us. And you have the handout, uh, guidebook in the handout. Please feel free to download them and then look through the, the guidebooks. It has a lot of details. But of course, we leave out a lot of uh, minor tricks and tricks because it is up to personal pra uh, practices. Okay. And uh, I'll see, we have the next session, session three, next Tuesday, same time. 3 p.m. Singapore and Malaysia time is the same. Okay, so uh, we're we'll talking about uh, housekeeping protein, total protein normalization, the differences, advantages and disadvantages, and how what you can do if you still want to go for your housekeeping protein, what you can do with it. Okay, how you want to make sure that you have a good one. Okay, then if you go for total protein stain, what are the criteria you need to go for? Choosing the suitable one walk through the total protein stain protocol, it would be quite easy because normally it's incorporated in your lesson plotting. It's a very short one. Then how are you going to publish total protein stains in the publication and how are you going to analyze it? Okay, uh, so I'm Kailin. So we have Nicole over here with Ting Ting and Kevin, uh, Ting Ting from Excel Scientific and Kevin from uh, Epica from Malaysia. So if you have any questions and queries, please feel free to email us and ask more. I will uh, please ask us more and uh, if you need some kind of topics, we can formulate a workshop or webinars to specifically address that kind of topics. Okay, thank you and I'll see you guys next Tuesday.